Up next, Gordon and I take a look at the Lumix GX800 slash GX850 on the Camera Labs Photography Podcast. Hi, this is Doug Kay. I'm here with Mr. Camera Labs' Gordon Lang. We're going to take a look at the Lumix GX800 or GX850 as we know it here in the U.S. Hey, Gordon, how are you doing? I'm very good. Thank you, Doug. This is the GX800, as we call it in uh, the rest of the world, or as you call it in North America, the GX850. But I'm just going to jump right in there before we get started and say thank you to everyone who continues to support our work at Camera Labs, whether you buy us a coffee, get the T-shirt, get the book, uh, or if you're ever shopping for anything at Amazon, Adder Armour or B&H, uh, if you click through our links first, that really, really helps. It doesn't matter what you're buying. It could be underpants. It could be music. It could even be a new camera. Uh, that That's excellent. Now, Doug... Is that is that a copy of Gordon Lang's in-camera book you're holding? Up there? That is exactly what this is. Hey, I finally got my own copy. I want to thank you for that. Uh, but I want to tell everybody, this is really a great book. Of course, I expected a good book from you, Gordon, but it's very unusual. It's not your typical just photography book. It's filled with great images, but it's particularly aimed at helping people get the best image possible straight out of the camera. And it's got a lot of information as well as great pictures. I really do recommend this to everybody. Go get In Camera from Gordon Lang. Thank you very much. You support our work and you get yourself a book at the same time. Best value on the internet today. However, also representing very good value is uh, the GX800 or GX850, so I'm going to have to keep referring to it. This is Panasonic's entry-level mirrorless camera. This is their lowest price camera in the in the mirrorless segment. So it's an interchangeable lens camera that uses the Micro Four Thirds format. Um it replaces the kind of jointly replaces the earlier GF and the GM series. I'm going to tell you a bit more about them during this video and podcast because it is a podcast as well. If you're watching the video on YouTube or at CamelLabs.com, check out the podcast. You can subscribe to that at iTunes or I think it's on Google Play. I submitted it. Uh, you know, it should be there. If any of you are, you know, consuming it, if you can't find it on your on your player or your subscription device, let us know and I'll see what I can do. If you can't find it, let me know what you're using. And if you are listening to the audio, then come check out the video sometime and you will see me holding the camera up here as I will demonstrate it to you. So just the headline features of this camera to start off with. Entry-level mirrorless camera. So it is one of the most affordable uh entry points to mirrorless interchangeable lens photography. It has a 16 megapixel micro four thirds sensor, a tilting touch screen that's ideal for selfies or vlogging. And it comes almost whether you like it or not with this uh, collapsing kit zoom, which I'll show you in a minute, which is a 24 to 64 millimeter equivalent range. And because it's a Panasonic, it of course films 4K video and has all of their clever 4K movie modes. So, Doug, that actually sounds like quite a lot of camera for your money. How much money are we talking about? Yeah, here in the U.S., this is $548 with that kit zoom, which makes it, I think, one of the very least expensive Micro Four Thirds cameras. Yeah, now... Um this camera doesn't have a viewfinder, and, and Olympus also has viewfinderless uh, models and, and some smaller models with viewfinders as well. That's their pen series. But they've not updated it at the lower end for a while. So I'm gonna we're gonna talk about some other rivals in this in this show and also some premium compacts, which I think is quite important because this camera is really aimed at people who are looking at a kind of a step forward in quality and control and flexibility over either an existing point and shoot camera or a mobile phone. It's also going to be worth mentioning uh, entry level DSLRs, although they are considerably larger than this. But within Panasonic's own range itself, there are now three GX models. So at the entry level, there is the GX 800 or 850. Then the next model up is the GX80, or in North America, the GX85. This adds an electronic viewfinder and is also typically sold with this same kit zoom. Doug, how much am I looking at for a GX85? You're going to spend $150 more, just coming in under $700. Yeah, and this is one of the, I mean, it does have more than just the electronic viewfinder, in, you know, in addition to what you get here. But it does kind of illustrate how expensive electronic viewfinders are. And we'll see this when we're making more comparisons later. If you're after a camera with a viewfinder, this is an area where mirrorless cameras struggle at the entry level because it is quite expensive to deploy one of these things compared to an optical viewfinder in a, in a DSLR, which can be quite affordable. Now there is a model above even the GX80, GX85, and that would be the GX8 
And I would like to say that in North America, it's called the GX eight and a half, but it's not. It is the GX eight everywhere. Probably it's, it's probably known as the GX seven point eight in Germany and something else in Japan. But we're just going to call it the GX eight. How much is the GX eight, Doug? All right. So that tips the scale at just about a thousand dollars, but that's for the body only. So let's note that this GX eight hundred eight fifty is only available with a lens, as far as we know. So a thousand dollars for the body only for the GX eight. Yeah, and that gets you a 20 megapixel micro full thirds camera with built-in stabilization, tilting, uh, tilting viewfinder, as well as a fully articulated screen. It's quite an interesting product, but for me, if I was going to be spending that amount of money on a Panasonic camera, I would go for the newer Lumix G80 or G85. This is not a GX. This is another one. It kind of slots in between. How much is a G80, or rather, how much is the G85 in North America? Uh, again, around $1,000, but this one does include a kit lens. Yeah, and it's not this one either. It's the 12 to 60, which is actually a really, really nice lens. Uh, Panasonic has two versions of that, a Lumix version and a Leica version. Leica version is nicer, but the Lumix version is very good. They do really nice entry-level uh, zooms. So that gives you a kind of overview of what you can expect in the Panasonic range. So this is an entry-level model. This is supposed to tempt you. If you're just shooting with your phone, then you should be looking at this. If Panasonic's done their homework properly, you should be looking at this camera and going, wow, you know, I really fancy this. This is this is what I want. This is what I want to upgrade to. So let's uh, let's have a quick look at the, the actual uh, physical design of this camera. I'm going to start with this uh, kit zoom that it's got, this 12 to 32. In the micro four thirds world, the size of the sensor reduces the field of view by two times that's why i refer to these 12 to 32 as a 24 to 64 millimeter lens in equivalent terms um now 24 millimeter is actually quite wide for a kit zoom to offer you know most of them start off at about 28 millimeter equivalent so it's already starting quite wide which is really nice doesn't zoom very far though equivalent of 64 mil i mean that's that's barely more than kind of standard coverage it's barely barely getting onto telephoto so even for kind of portrait use it's not great but for kind of landscape and general use it's nice at the wide end now, this is what they call a collapsing kit zoom. The idea is, is that they've designed this lens to kind of shrink back when you're not using it. If you are using it, you need to expand it. And you do that by twisting the zoom ring. So you can see how large it is now. If you're listening, you can't see it. it's about two and a half inches deep. Then if I twist the zoom ring, you'll see that the lens pops out the front. It's a manual twist. It's not a, a motorized process. So you can do it pretty quickly, which which I like. The ones that mo that are motorized and come out, they kind of annoy me a bit because you're going, oh, it's, it's taking too long to come out. So now the camera will power up. If you try and power it up with the, uh, with the lens folded in, this is what it says. Let me just show you. It says, please extend the lens. Like, like if you're on the London Underground, it tells you to please mind the gap. Please extend the lens. And then when you extend the lens, it will actually let you shoot. There you go. Look, there I am. Hello. On the screen on the back. Um, and that's it. Now, this lens is an f3.5 to 5.6 lens. And that's important because I'm going to mention the potential for shallow depth of field. In fact, you know what? I'm going to talk about that more in the video, but I'm just going to show you a picture now. This is kind of the maximum shallow depth of field you're going to get with this lens. So this is with me focusing... Uh, very close to a subject and I've got the lens fully zoomed into its maximum focal length and what with the aperture wide open this is about as shallow a depth of field as you're going to get with this lens and as you can see you can blur the background a bit but not that much but of course this camera has a benefit over uh, fixed lens models in that you can take the lens off and put something else on we're going to talk about that in a minute so, Doug, what are your feelings so far? Do you think, because the manufacturers always tell us in slightly kind of weepy terms how phones have killed the compact market and that this, you know, $550 camera is, is entry level now. You know, it's not like, you know, there was a time when a $150 camera was entry level, even a $50 camera. But that they've kind of almost disappeared. And it's it's just phones at that end. What do you what do you think about the likelihood of someone going for a, a camera like this? Well, you know, I do get requests for people who, from people who say, I, I, what camera should I get? And I'd like to spend no more than five or $600. So this is, you know, one of the few cameras that fits that bill, unless you're looking at you know the real the premium compact something like an older version of the sony rx 100 um which is now down to that range and by the way the focal length range doesn't bother me too much it's pretty close to a 24 to 70s which is what you typically get with these it's very close to that um 
I, I'm very interested to hear what you have to say about the aperture and the ISO, uh, because that that it does make quite a bit of difference. But you know, I think there's definitely a place for this. The the, the world needs a low end micro four thirds camera. <laughs> Well, I'm sure I saw a Panasonic uh, representative wearing that written on a T-shirt. It's a good slogan. Now, if you're composing with this camera, it is. So it's telling me, you see, I've, I've folded, I've retracted the lens again. It's telling me, please rotate the zoom ring to externally. Yes, all right. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. You're composing only with the screen on this. At this price point um, from Panasonic, you're not going to be getting a built-in electronic viewfinder. So it's with this screen on the back only. Now, it does tilt up by 180 degrees to face the subject. There we are. Uh, this is, of course, for self-portraits or for filming pieces to camera. This camera Panasonic sees as appealing to uh, vloggers. I'm going to talk about that in a minute as well. Uh, it is a touch screen, as you would hope, from Panasonic. And you can, it's not just like how Sony have recently adopted touch screens and, and only use it for like a couple of things. Panasonic let you do all sorts of things with it. You can tap to, you can tap your way through all manner of menus, which a lot of people don't let you do. You can of course tap to reposition the focusing area, which is very quick and easy. And you can tap to pull focus in video. In fact, why don't I show you a video right now where I'm using the touch screen to tap to pull focus. And again, this is with the kit zoom. So it's not a massively shallow depth of field. There's not that much blurring, but you can see how the camera is refocusing between the object in the foreground and the rear of the cafe uh, in the background. Now it's a contrast based system, focusing system. It is not phase detect. What that means is that it sometimes has to do a little wobble. It sometimes has to focus beyond the, the point and then go, oh, I've gone a bit too far. I've got to pull it back. And then, oh, I've gone a bit too far again. I'm going to go back. And it kind of wobbles very, very slowly, like a, a ball, a bouncing ball that's just going to its, its final bounces before it settles. That's kind of how a contrast-based system works. Panasonic uh, have profiled this lens, though, for use with its DFD uh, or focusing system, which, which can kind of better guess where it's going to go. And it is very quick in single autofocus. And like a lot of Panasonic cameras, it also focuses at very, very low light levels down to minus four EV, which is an advantage it has even over still some very high end products. Doug and I recently reviewed the Sony A9, which is Sony's kind of, I'm not going to call it its flagship because they don't, it's their most expensive camera, four and a half thousand dollar mirrorless camera that can only do minus three EV. And I was comparing it against the Canon EOS 1DX Mark II, which was what, Doug, five and a half grand? Something like that, yeah. And that can only do minus three EV. Nikon's D5 can do minus four EV, and that was, that's like six grand, isn't it? I think the A, the, the A7, Sony A7S Mark II, I think, may have a very good low light focusing. Yeah, and you know, this is, this is something, you know, it's, it's very important to look at all aspects of autofocus, that there are some cameras that will be better at continuous autofocusing than this Panasonic. But in terms of single autofocus, in terms of focusing in low light, which of course you probably are going to be doing if you're using this, you know, with your friends in when you're going out to parties or to the pub or, you know, to theatres or whatever, you, you can be fairly confident that this thing is not going to go, oh, I'm, I'm struggling to focus. Oh, I'm going, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. So it's... Um, it does focus in low light, which I really like. I'm going to show you around the body a little bit more. Uh, you will notice that it has a proper mode dial. It, you can put this into program, aperture, shutter, priority, and full manual. This is a camera that, as offering a step up from a phone, gives you this degree of control. You can, you know, learn about aperture and shutter speed if that's what you want to get into. It also has a fully automatic intelligent auto mode. It has some scene presets, Panasonic's effects. It has a panorama mode. Um, in terms of the, the kind of picture styles they've actually got a fairly respectable looking black and white mode in fact i was going to mention this later but i'm going to show you right now here's a picture i took in the uh, black and white mode and i always go on about how i like fujifilm's black and white but i think panasonic's getting quite good at this now i mean this is not the uh the monochrome the l monochrome setting that you get on some of its higher end bodies this is just one of the i think this is dynamic monochrome in, in the effects, but I think it looks pretty good. And this again goes back to, I know I'm going to try and advertise my book again, but this goes back to the idea behind my book, which is that if a camera is doing really nice processing inside by itself, it saves you doing it. And as you explore them and, you know, find out more about which modes can deliver what kind of results, you might actually think, you know what, I don't need to post process this image. It's, it's already looking good enough. Doug, do you use any of the black and white modes in any of these cameras? Uh, you know, I often have my preview on the camera set to black and white, which means the default 
preview JPEG that goes into the raw file is also going to be black and white. I still have the color if I need it. But uh, yeah, I tend to use it, especially when I'm shooting with the Fuji cameras. Of course, they have marvelous modes. But absolutely. Um, you know, I think this camera is one because of its price point, is more likely to be used by JPEG shooters and people who do want to experiment with those in-camera modes. Yeah, definitely. Now, one of the other things that I wanted to show you uh, on the top, because we've, we talk about Panasonic's 4K photo modes. This is where the company realized that if you're filming in 4K video, you can take still photographs from that video and end up with an 8 megapixel image. Sure, it's not the full 16 megapixels of this sensor, but 8 megapixels is good enough for sharing. It's good enough for a small print. You know, it's, it's actually quite good. The benefit, of course, is that you're grabbing it from video that's filming at 30 frames per second. So, I mean, this camera can shoot at five frames per second at the full resolution with autofocus. But if you switch into the 4K, K mode, you're shooting at 30 frames per second. Okay, a reduced resolution of eight megapixels, but still 30 frames per second. So when you're shooting action or, you know, like a fidgety uh, subject for a portrait, like a kid or, or even me, if I'm not feeling that happy, then, you know, you, you see the expression change and you can go back and forth and select that. But Panasonic also let you do some tricks. I'm going to show you that. But before I show you that, I'm going to show you two buttons on the uh, top of the camera. The one closest to the shutter release is the 4K photo mode button here. This allows you to go straight into 4k photo mode and select which mode you want to shoot in my favorite one is the one which actually takes a second it kind of keeps a rolling buffer of the last seconds worth of action so if you're waiting for say a bird to take off and i'm going to show you an example of that in a minute you wait for a bird to take off the instant it takes off you've missed it you've missed the important part where it's, the wing is out and it does that first flap and you can see on its face it's going <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna fly i'm gonna fly today this bird so um i don't know where that came from but i quite like quite like that bird that's <laughs> that is how the seagulls in brighton talk i'm gonna fly today and i'm gonna eat your pizza because that's the other thing they do now the other button here is a dedicated post focus button because this is uh, one of panasonic's coolest tricks where you take a photo in post focus and actually what it does is it films video while it focuses from the closest to the furthest subject uh, in the composition and it remembers at what point in the video it was focused on certain parts so that when you go back to play this picture, this is the really clever bit, when it goes back to play uh, the, uh, the picture, you can actually tap the screen and it goes, you know what? Where he's tapping, I remember that was like two seconds into the video. Let's fast forward to it and make it look like he's in the future and he's actually tapping the screen to change the focus. It's actually just fast forwarding and rewinding. I'm going to show you and uh, forgive me if I accidentally swipe the picture away. It's going to happen, I'm sure. So here, let me see. Can you see that picture, Doug? Yeah. So this is inside Buy Some Beer which is a, uh, a fabulous beer shop in uh, in Brighton. And uh, these are some lovely Trappist beers from uh, from Belgium. There's a Rochefort, Rochefort Trappist at the front. So it's focused on that. But if I just tap here, please let it work. Did it work? Yes, it did. Is it, it's refocused on the back. Mm -hmm. And then what I can do is say, you know what? I, I actually want this one. I want this closest one, the Rochefort 10. Has it refocused? Excellent. Yes, very good. You see, I, I'm, I'm doing this blind for your pleasure. I hope you can see that. So you're actually refocusing off to the event. And this is a great trick to show your friends in the pub. They're like, wow, this is the future. This is fantastic. It's just a clever media player, but no one else is really doing it. You know, this is this to me is really, really cool. The other thing it lets you do is also now, uh, you know, that just just tapping it is one thing. You then press the uh, the button in the middle and say and it says, look, do you want to do you want to save this picture as a separate JPEG? And you say, yes, please. It's still not doing that as a raw, but you can save save those as JPEG. So you've got this one kind of file. I could I could extract a JPEG image at eight megapixels of the closest subject, one of the furthest subject. But one of the more cool things that they've done on the more recent models is where you can say, well, I'll tell you what, actually, I want I want it all in focus. And you'll say, well, go on then. Show me the furthest thing away you want in focus and show me the closest thing. So you're actually specifying a range and then extract that as a JPEG. And I, th I think that's really cool to be able to do that and it, it does work well we've demonstrated it quite a few times I'm, I'm going to show you again here so you have auto merging or range merging and if i go for range merging and you'll notice how i operated that interface by touch you can literally just sort of t say look you know i want the beer so we'll have this beer at the front and i want this beer at the back and you see how it's overlaid all those focusing mm, points it's saying yeah. hey i've got information for all those points i'll say right that's what i want then i click the button in the middle and it says do you want to save that do you want to merge that so this is proper focus stacking that's going on in camera yes i do 
And it takes a few seconds because this is some quite heavy lifting, this processing that is, Jim. But you can see that bar going along. Mm -hmm. takes a few seconds. Doug, do you think this is a feature that you would use? Uh, I do. I do. I've played with this kind of thing with the, the Panasonic cameras, not that specific one, but some of the other 4K uh, shooting modes. And, you know, I, I think it's great. So it's still working this out. We're going to do this in real time. Why not? We have a nice leisurely show. That's right. It's I'll, almost I'll done. Have some, I'll have some more coffee. Yeah, why not? Look at that. And it's done. And there it is. There is our focus stacked image, which has everything from near to far in sharp focus. All done in camera, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, so Panasonic don't just, you know, they don't just put this on their high end uh, products. It's, it's, it's on all of them. So I, I'm, I'm impressed that they do that. Is, is this is this a 4K mode? Do you end up with an 8 megapixel JPEG from this? Yes, you do. Okay. Yes, you do. And in fact, I'm now going to show you the other mode. This is 4K photo. And I'm going to show you the example of uh, of the birds flying. So I saw two seagulls. All right, Dave. Yeah, that bloke's taking a picture of us again. Let's uh, take off uh, at the same time and it will be fabulous. But he won't be quite quick enough to catch it. So here are these two seagulls. This is actually very close to where Fatboy Slim, the DJ, uh, lives in Brian. But anyway, there you go. Here they are, the two seagulls. This is the point at which they took off and I was fast enough to take the picture. How lame am I? That's rubbish. You know, I've completely missed the moment. Ah, but here's the thing. As soon as I press the button, it committed the last second's worth of action. So what I can do is actually rewind. I can go back in time. Now, because I've got the screen flipped up, I'm not quite sure which way it's going to do it. So I'm going to go one way and then the other. So, Doug, tell me, am I going forwards or backwards when I do this? Uh, backwards. Backwards. So look, this look is what that. I've got. And there they are. Birds at rest. Yeah, completely stationary. And then I can go forward one frame at a time and go, you know what? Where is it looking at? Do you see what I mean about that big wing? Oh, yeah. I'm going to flop my big wing. Oh, it's so hard to take off but i'm doing it and there it is and you look at them and then one of these will hopefully be good and then you just press the button in the middle to extract that you know as a, as, a, as a new jpeg so you know these are really fun actually that's not a bad picture i think i'll have that yeah yeah so look at look at this one so that's quite nice they kind of the, the wings join up nice symmetry make a nice circle yeah yeah so i can press the button and say yeah i want to extract that do you want to save this image yes i do it actually saves those instantly because it's not doing a, a focus blending so i've now saved that picture as an eight megapixel jpeg and i i really like that you know um and it's a really nice feature to have. And these are these are pretty unique things that Panasonic offers. And when we make some comparisons with some rival products in a minute, this is the one thing that makes these Lumix cameras unique. None of the others have this. Some of them film 4K. Some of them let you extract a still, but none of them have got this nice user interface that let you that let you choose the exact picture. None of them are doing this kind of pre-burst capture. Well, some of them are, but at a higher end, at a higher price. So to get all of this and then the focus stacking and, and the refocusing after the event, to get that in a $550 camera, I think is pretty compelling. And that's one of the things that they're going to try and tempt you with if you're an existing phone photographer. If I had one of those, I'd become a time traveler. I'd be able to go back in time and, and film the previous uh, few seconds of my life. I like that. <laughs> Let me open up the battery compartment uh, for a special reason, right? Because that is not an, a normal full-size SD memory card. This camera. Teeny little thing. It's a teeny one. This takes S SD teeny, teeny, teeny SDs. Look, there's my teeny SD. It's a micro SD, micro SD card. Believe it or not, there was no room in this camera for sort of a full-size SD slot. Uh, Panasonic said that when they basically decided to go with 4K on this, the kind of heat sinks and, and the electronics that they needed to accommodate that meant they couldn't put a full-size slot in it. That's how packed these things are. The battery is quite small. I got 100 shots out of it and a few minutes of 4K video and, a, you know, a couple of Wi-Fi transfers to my phone. So it's not huge, but I am pleased to say that you can recharge this camera over USB. So, you know, when you're driving from one location to another or if you've got a portable USB battery, you can top it up. So um, it doesn't have a huge battery, but battery life has never been an issue for me while I was testing it because... You know, I can always top it up. And I think you're a fan of USB charging as well, aren't you? I am. I am because I hate traveling with chargers. 
Yeah, definitely. Well, let me tell you quickly about the Wi-Fi. It has built-in Wi-Fi. It doesn't have NFC. Panasonic kind of were behind NFC. Uh, quick, everyone, let's use NFC and tap our phones again. See, they're kind of not so into that now. It does add a little bit of extra cost. I really like it. But then I've got a Samsung phone that has NFC built in, not just NFC for paying for things in Apple's world. I mean, NFC for doing other stuff. So it's really Sony that's that's going to that now. But the Wi-Fi works pretty well on it. You can remote control the camera. You can take photos. You can change all of the exposure settings. You can remote trigger a movie. You can, of course, copy images over Wi-Fi. And you can also make a GPS log with your phone. That in a slightly convoluted approach, the GPS log, what you do is you synchronize the time on the camera and your phone. So they, the first of all, so you know that their, time, their clocks are the same. Then you say to the phone, right, you say to the app on the phone, this is the Lumix image app, right, you go and start recording a GPS log. Now, rather worryingly, when I did this with mine, I've seen it do this a few times recently. I don't know whether it's conflicting with other software I've gotten there. Might not happen to you. It might just happen to me because I'm testing all these cameras. It, um, it went, you know, I can't do it. I can't do it. I don't want to, I'm not doing it. I can't, I can't do it. And you're like, really? Oh. And then you get on with your testing and then you think, you know what? I think it has done it. I think it's just, it's a cry for help. So I, so the next step, assuming that you trust that it's got this log, is you then transfer the log into the camera. And then you say to the camera, right, apply it to the images. So I did that. And guess what? They all worked. The GPS log was was recorded successfully and it transferred successfully. It was just, it was just being a little... I don't know, playing hard to get or something. I'm not sure. The, the the app said it wasn't working, but it was. So if that happens to you, try it anyway, because it might just work. Like all these solutions, it's reliant on your phone having a good, clear communication with the GPS satellites. Sometimes on mine, it was a few meters out. Sometimes it wasn't. It depends whether it's in your pocket or a jacket pocket. If I'm doing some critical stuff, I normally leave it in the top of my backpack. So it's got, you know, like a clear a clear view of the sky without my pocket in the way. So these are these are kind of the basics. Um, I just wanted to talk about the 4K video on this. It, of course, films video with a, a minor crop. It'll do 4K up to 30p, 24, 25 or 30p uh, or 1080 if you prefer. The 4K video quality is pretty good. Now, I'm going to show you a clip now. You've already seen one of the focus pulling, but I'm going to show you a clip now of me pretending to be a vlogger walking through the streets of Brighton as a vlogger does. Now, we have a lot of vloggers in Brighton. We have um, Zoella, who's uh, one, of, one of the most famous ones. Uh, we also have, um, I think, PewDiePie. Is that how you pronounce it? The gamer. I think he's in Brighton as well. Lots of them. Lots of us are in Brighton. Very creative city. Anyway, here's me. You see me walking through the uh, Brighton's lanes where a lot of the nice shops are. I'm hand-holding the camera held out in front of me with the screen facing me. Right. I've got the lens which comes with it zoomed to 12 millimeter. I've got the optical stabilization enabled and I'm, I'm filming this. And I think probably the most the two things that you take away from watching this clip well, three things. One, I'm not a vlogger, so you're not going to see me walking the streets of Brighton going, oh, I've done this brilliant makeup routine. Although who knows what could happen in the future. Uh, but. The two technical things you can take away from this is that the face detection does work pretty well. It's kept me in focus. But the second thing I noticed is that there is a little bit of rolling shutter there. There's this kind of slightly shuddering type effect that you'll see. And that's because I don't think the optical stabilization on this lens is particularly good. It works, but it's not eerily good. And when I'm holding the camera out, you know, my my old kind of uh, coffee shakes come into play and it starts wobbling the camera at a very certain frequency. Now, if you're a young vlogger without any health issues then this probably won't be a problem for you but for a man of my advanced years it was a little bit and some cameras have got amazing stabilization like some of panasonic's the next models up in the range their built-in stabilization is fantastic yeah, i could vlog with that held out at arm's length no problem but with this camera there was a little bit of micro wobble from myself and that introduced a bit of rolling shutter because the the actual optical stabiliz stabilization of the lens wasn't soaking it up as well as it could do. I also noticed this when I was composing stills with it. Some, you know, most of the time I've been using cameras with stabilization that's so good that when you half press the shutter, you know what it's like, Doug, you half press the shutter and it's like, it's like the world stands still, doesn't it? You've, you've mm. seen that on like yeah. Olympus products. Absolutely amazing. On this, it didn't. The world stopped wobbling as much, but it certainly didn't stand still. So if you're going to use this camera for, for vlogging, if you've got a fairly steady hand, you should be all right. 
But if you're a little bit wobbly like me, you may find that the quality kind of suffers a bit because these cameras, the video modes do not like it when when you wobble the camera a little bit. You get this rolling shutter. You've seen that rolling shutter artifact before, haven't you, Doug? It's oh, it's not the most it. pleasant of things, is it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Something to be avoided. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's kind of wrap this up and look at the image quality. It's, so it's a 16 megapixel sensor. It doesn't have a an optical low pass filter, the AA filter. Um, that's a technical way of saying that it's removed the bit, which deliberately blurred it to try and avoid some issues. And the result is that are there any issues? No, I didn't see any moire on the picture. I, I think this is a this is a been an overblown issue. But the result is that you get very crisp images out of this camera and this lens. I've got loads of sample images at CameraLabs.com, so check them out. See what you think for yourself. I thought they were very, very good. I suspect this is a sensor that you see in some of Panasonic's higher-end uh, models, and it, it looks great. Anyway, the bottom line, it looks nice. The processing looks nice. You've seen the black and white picture. That looks pretty good. So the kind of question is now, and here's the big discussion, Doug, because I feel I've rambled and, and you've not really said much. I feel, <laughs> I feel I've feel neglected you. I apologize. I, no, I, I, I've been entertained, Gordon. You have? I hope yes, so. Yes, oh, absolutely. I hope you're not the only one. Yeah. <laughs> I hope others have been entertained too. Now, should you buy this camera if you're upgrading from a phone? Now, let's first of all, the most obvious rivals for this are other low-cost mirrorless cameras. Now, one that we keep going back to all the time, Doug and I, is the Sony A6000. You have one. Is that an A6000 or an A6300? It's a 6300, but it, it looks similar. It does look similar. Now, that, that camera, so the A6300 is, is actually quite expensive still, but the A6000, as the older model, is pretty affordable. How much are you looking at for a 6000 now? Yeah, that's now only $600 with the kit lens. So similar kind of ballpark to the uh, the Lumix GX100 or GX850. Now, it's high resolution. It's got 24 megapixels, the Sony. It also has a, um, a built-in electronic viewfinder. It's not as good as the latest electronic viewfinders, but it has one. The Lumix does not. And I have to say that in very bright conditions, I found it quite hard to view this screen on the Lumix. Of course, this is an issue you have with phones as well and cheaper point and shoots. But it does make me think that there are products available with built-in electronic viewfinders. And this is not one of them that are available at this price point. Now, the Sony doesn't have uh, that Sony. The A6000 doesn't have 4K uh, video, so it doesn't have 4K photo. It also doesn't have a touch screen. Um, but it does tilt up, but it doesn't tilt all the way forward to face the subject. So if you're into your selfies, it's not going to be any good to you. You're going to be shooting blind. Yeah, Doug's showing up right now. That's as far as as it goes, which is a shame. Even on the latest model, even on the A6500, that, that screen doesn't flip all the way, which is a shame because it's got an amazing phase detect autofocus system. But it does shoot very quickly and confidently. If you're into shooting action at a low price point, that is the one I would recommend. Then there's Canon's EOS M3. How much is Canon's cheapest mirrorless camera? Yeah, the EOS M3 is exactly $1 more than this camera, only 549 US with a kit lens. Yeah, that's with the 18 to 55 millimeters, not quite as wide, but it's zooming longer. Again, 24 megapixels, tilting touch screen, doesn't have 4K, doesn't have 4K photo, but still that's quite that's quite a compelling message. Never thought I'd say that about a Canon EOS M. Doesn't have a viewfinder though. You can see a kind of pattern emerging here. It's rare to get a viewfinder, an electronic viewfinder at this price point. Fujifilm's XA3, that is their entry level mirrorless. How much is that? 599, so another $50 on top of this one. So you can see it's all coming in at around the $600 mark. That's with uh, the 16 to 50 millimeter zoom. That's their basic one. It's another 24 megapixel sensor. It's APS-C like the Sony and the Canon. That's a bigger, high resolution sensor than Panasonic have got. None of these have got built-in stabilization. That Fujifilm does give you a tilting touch screen, three inch. I should say though, it's not an X-Trans sensor. So you are not getting like an X-T2 or an X-T20 quality at an entry level there. If you want their cheapest uh x trans body with the latest sensor that's the st20 and that's that's like over a thousand dollars so that's a different ballpark now i speak to a lot of students of photography and they say i'm after the cheapest camera that has interchangeable lenses and a viewfinder and as mr mirrorless i like to go well how about this and i'm, I'm sort of struggling to find really cheap cameras that are mirrorless with built-in viewfinders you know that sony is about the only one because it's uh, an older model it's been discounted if you were to buy a current model with a built-in viewfinder you're looking near eight hundred dollars however this is an area 
where Canon and Nikon continue to clean up because you can buy an entry level DSLR very cheaply and they have built in viewfinders. It's not electronic, but it's a built in viewfinder and they're a DSLR. So your uh, tutor who is probably, you know, not into those cameras, will go, oh, well done for buying that Canon and Nikon DSLR. You can, you've passed already. So how much is a Canon EOS T6 DSLR, Doug? DS, uh, T6 comes in actually $100 less expensive than this um, uh, Lumix. It's 449 with kit lens. Yeah, that's with the 18 to 55 millimeter. That's uh, 18 megapixels, but it's APS-C. So it's a bigger, se- so a bigger sensor and an optical viewfinder for a hundred dollars less yeah it doesn't do 4k video uh, it's not a small uh, it's not going to fit in your pocket that dslr it's quite chunky but that's still quite a compelling message and it's interesting that when you are into modern technology like mirrorless cameras as i am and you, you think well how, how much longer can entry-level dslrs compete because you know the, the amount of technology they pack into these mirrorless ones is really exciting but you know they, they, they're competing on price those Canon, you know, if you're a student, you've not got a lot of money on your side. And those entry-level DSLRs are really cheap. And that's why you see so many people with them. You know, they're a very compelling option. What do you think of all of I mean, what would you get around that price point, Doug? Someone's asked you for an entry-level product. Do you think it's important for a beginner to have 4K photo or 4K movies? Or is it more important to have a, a viewfinder? Well, I'm going to ask them, of course, what they want to shoot. Do they want to shoot view, video? And do they want the 4K video for stills, that kind of thing? But... You know, the camera that I might recommend in this price range, and I want to get your feedback on this, would be something like an earlier version of this Sony RX100. The RX100 Mark, this is the Mark IV, they're now up to the Mark V, but the Mark II is still available Mm -hmm. for only $598, $50 more than the camera we're reviewing today. And something that you touched on, I want to make sure we cover, this camera has a faster lens. It's f1.8 to 2.8, depending on the focal length. Uh, The sensor is smaller than the micro four thirds, but the question is, given that you have a faster lens, does the size of the sensor and the number of megapixels make a difference? How do you compare? And by the way, these cameras have fully tilt up screens. Mm -hmm. You get the selfie mode. Um, They are completely pocketable. The only downside of these cameras is that they don't have the interchangeable lens. But tell me about this difference in in uh, sensor size versus lens speed. Okay, so we'll go back to something I mentioned at the beginning, which is this zoom lens on the Lumix is f3.5 to 5.6, depending on whether it's at the wide end or the telephoto end. And that is a fairly typical focal ratio, fairly typical aperture for a kit zoom. All of the lenses that I've mentioned on all of these cameras at this price point, they all have f3.5 to 5.6. That's, that's pretty standard. Now, Doug's camera there, the RX100 Mark, whatever, and things like the Canon G7X series, they generally have brighter focal ratios, f1.8 to 2.8, typically. So that's two stops brighter at both ends of the scale, right? Because f1.8 is about two stops brighter than f3.5, and f2.8 is about two stops brighter than f5.6, right? Did I get all those numbers it's right? A, I think it's so. exactly two times. So it's, right. two, so it's two stops, two stops benefit, right? Mm-hmm. Now, what that means is that if these cameras have got their, they say they're in very low light, so they're shooting with their apertures wide open to try and minimize the sensitivity for the best quality. And you, so let's say you've, you've, you can't reduce the shutter speed anymore because you, you want to achieve either you want to freeze the action or you want to eliminate camera shake. So you can't change the shutter speed. You cannot change the aperture. It's already at the maximum value. You can't make it any brighter because you're not allowed. Uh, so what the only thing you can do is increase or reduce the ISO sensitivity. Now, if you're shooting, let's say, with that Sony camera at 200 ISO, then this camera, under exactly the same lighting situation, conditions, with exactly the same shutter speed, will be shooting two stops slower. So that's not 200 ISO. It's not 400 ISO. It's 800 ISO, right? 800 ISO versus 200 ISO. Now, this camera has the benefit of a larger sensor compared to that Sony, but it's being forced to shoot two stops higher ISO to make up for the fact it's, its lens isn't as bright as the one on the Sony. And this is the thing that's very critical here is that all of these cameras that I've mentioned so far all have bigger sensors than these premium point and shoots. 
does the micro four thirds sensor is bigger than one inch. APS-C is even bigger still. But if you couple them with a lens that's optically slow, like f3.5 to 5.6, then you may well find yourself eliminating any benefit of that bigger sensor in terms of high ISO performance uh, because you're having to shoot at higher ISOs, you know. Um, and the fact is, is that this camera at 800 ISO, you, you know, it is probably not as good as that Sony at 200 ISO. And that two-stop difference remains throughout. So you might think to yourself, well, surely there's got to be some benefit to having that bigger sensor. What about in terms of depth of field? How much can I do blurring? Well, I've done side-by-side -side tests. And again, the smaller format of the Sony is compensated by the brighter aperture. So when you have both of these cameras zoomed into their maximum telephoto with the, you know, with the Sony at f2.8 and with one of these at f5.6, you're going to get a similar amount of blurring. Right. So you don't get any benefit. They say, well, where, what benefit am I going to get? The only benefit you get from a bigger sensor over a smaller sensor is when you fit a lens of the same focal ratio. So, for example, and this is the big benefit that this camera has over, say, uh, Doug's Canon, sorry, or Sony, is that I can remove this lens. Right. And I can put this lens on. This is, an, uh, this is one of mine. This is an Olympus 17 millimeter F 1.8 lens. Now, when I put this lens on. Still quite pocketable, still quite small. It's a fixed focal length lens now, equivalent to 34 millimeter. It's still a reasonably small package, this. This is now an f1.8 lens. So this is as bright as the Sony is, right? So under the same conditions, they're using the same focal ratio. They're using the same uh, shutter speed, for example. But the big difference here now is that they're using the same ISO because the exposure is exactly the same. And let's say that because it's really dim, they're both having to shoot at, um, at 800 ISO. Well, this is going to produce a better result because it is a bigger sensor. Larger pixels in particular. Exactly. Exactly right. Now, of course, the story is actually even more complicated than that because anyone who's really paying attention at this point will go, ah, but Gordon, that lens you've just put on doesn't have optical stabilization and the body doesn't have built-in sensor stabilization. So if I was to put this lens on, then I would have to be careful of the shutter speed, whereas the Sony... And all of these premium compacts have got built in, have got optical stabilization. So they will let me hand hold at slower shutter speeds. And so if I can reduce the shutter speed, then I can reduce the ISO and get that quality back. But if I can't, then a bigger sensor will win on quality, but only if the ISO is the same. You know what I mean? If you're having to use a higher ISO because the lens isn't bright enough, isn't gathering as much light, then... You lose that benefit of the big sensor. Now, it can be very confusing. You do have to sit down and think it through. But for me, cameras like this only make sense if you are going to change the lenses, right? Mm -hmm. Because you can get all those 4K photo modes in one of Panasonic's uh, premium compacts. You could get an LX10 or an LX15 and have all the benefit of those, of the, and of the great quality movies and the manual control. But you have a brighter lens and you have a smaller body. You will only get, I think, the benefit of the bigger sensor on an interchangeable lens camera if you interchange those lenses. That's right. So I brought another one up to show you. So this is the 17 millimeter f1.8, which, by the way, also you're going to be able to get a nice shallow depth of field. If you want a really shallow depth of field, how about this? This is the oldie but goodie. This is a 45 millimeter f1.8 uh from olympus again it's not optically stabilized this is equivalent to 90 millimeter and this can really blur the background very nicely on portraits and it's still quite small and portable so if you start getting into portrait photography get one of these lenses stick it on you can't do that with those premium compacts from sony and canon and on panasonic and everyone else who makes them but once again, we come back to this thing that if you are thinking, if you do have like five, six hundred dollars to spend, you do want to step up in quality over a, a point over a, over a smartphone. Any of these cameras are going to give you that step up. But I would only go for one of these interchangeable lens cameras if you are at some point, either straight away or in the future, if you are going to change the lenses. Because if you aren't, if you're going to live with this camera permanently attached with this 12 to 32 yeah, it's nice and light and all the rest of it, but it is not giving you any benefit in quality or depth of field over the lens that you would get in, say, that Sony RX100. And I should say that the RX100 Mark III also gives you an electronic viewfinder, which is lovely. It is quite expensive. It's about $700. But, you know, the Canon G7X Mark II, $679, uh, doesn't have an electronic viewfinder. But still, have a look at those. For me, those are the really key rivals, not the other entry-level interchangeable lens cameras, but those those smaller compacts. 
And as I say, within Panasonic's own line, that LX10, LX15 is really nice. And Doug and I have reviewed that camera too. And I, I still dare you to put that in your pocket. <laughs> it's big. This, this is still my 24 yes. to 70 in a pocket. And if I want to take a camera and just, you know, I often, I usually shoot with prime lenses. I don't really own mini zooms, but you know, I'll go out with some other camera for a special purpose. If I want to carry a general purpose 24 to 70, a compact like the RX100, or perhaps a camera like the uh, uh, GX850, these are really great for that. They're sort of, um, sort of jack of all trades, master of none cameras. So I think ultimately you have to think very carefully about how you're going to shoot. And in particularly, are, are you going to swap lenses? Yeah. If you're not going to swap lenses, my gut feeling would be to go to the premium compact line for that first step up from uh, from a smartphone. Um, and all of those cool things that I showed you, you know, about the 4K photo, you can do that on on the on the Lumix premium cameras. This isn't me bashing Panasonic in the slightest. I love their technologies. Uh, but at the entry level, you may be better off with if you're not going to change the lens with one of their fixed lens bodies. If you are going to change lenses, then sure, the whole the whole this whole world of interchangeable lenses wonderful world of interchangeable lenses comes up and there are some lovely lovely lenses uh, available for the micro four third system in fact it's the most established of the mirrorless formats it has it has a ridiculous amount of lenses now it's like over 50 lenses you know fast approaching what canon nikon offer with their dslrs it's 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 a significant collection uh cheap and expensive long short everything so if you do want to get into it this is going to be your cheapest point of entry for that but don't kid yourself. If you're not going to change lenses, consider perhaps that a premium compact with a fixed lens is a better choice. Well, very good. I think we've got another great camera. I wish that uh, Panasonic Lumix had a little, little clearer way of naming and numbering their cameras because it's one of the most confusing things in the world to me, at least. This is once again, the Lumix GX800, or as it's known here in North America, or at least the US, the GX850. I have to look at my notes to make sure I get that right. Gordon, I want to thank you once again for a terrific review. Uh, remind everybody that their will be a much more detailed review over at cameralabs.com. If you're interested in purchasing this camera or any of the cameras we review here on the Camera Labs Photography Podcast, please go to cameralabs.com, click on the Buy Now links there. It puts a little bit of money in our pockets. It buys coffee. You can also buy us cups of coffee right there on the website. You can buy a t-shirt and don't forget Gordon's in-camera book. And I'll make my own pitch. If you're interested in a photo workshop for street photography, go over to DougK.com and check out my workshops. Gordon, it's been a pleasure once again. It always is, Doug. And you took all the words right out of my mouth. I don't need to do any, any more self-promotion. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, like, and subscribe, as Adam Buxton would say. Listen to his podcast. It's really fun. Um, and uh, check out our reviews at cameras.com and come back and see us soon. Yeah, very good. Thanks, Gordon. See you next time. Bye-bye.